Let us hear these words from the first letter of John. What marvelous love the Father has extended to us. Just look at it. We're called children of God. That's who we really are. But that's also why the world doesn't recognize us or take us seriously, because it has no idea who God is or what God's up to. But friends, that's exactly who we are. Children of God. And that's only the beginning. Who knows how we'll end up? What we know is that when Christ is openly revealed, we will see Him. And in seeing Him, become like Him. All of us who look forward to His coming, stay ready. With the glistening purity of Jesus' life, as a model for our own. In these wonderful words, we are invited into an awareness, into being more focused on what we are as God's creation. Just yesterday, I went home my, back to my childhood home of Independence, Missouri. You see, I went to a visitation. A family that lived on the same street as ours. Our family had three boys. This family had three girls of the same age. We grew up together. Our parents knew one another, worked with one another in the community. But I had not seen the Slayton girls for years, years and years and years. One I'm sure I haven't seen for 30 years. So I arrived at this visitation, and I'm sure you've had similar experiences, perhaps at a high school reunion. My 40th is coming up this fall. I uh, haven't decided if I'm going yet. But yesterday's example might encourage me to go to the high school reunion. Because as I did, I walked into that room and it was like a family embrace. I immediately felt at home and part of that wonderful family. I talked to Lisa, who was my age, and we, we were kind of a terror in the neighborhood growing up. And uh, I said, do you remember Drew Dimmel and the Dimmel boys who had a wonderful band in Kansas City, the Classmen, and uh, used to uh, open for the um, Osmond family in Las Vegas and a lot of, had some really interesting history. Well, they came into the visitation too. And I said, Drew, Lisa and I were just talking about when you would play in the Stacy's driveway for a block party for the whole neighborhood. And while they were doing their classics, Lisa and I were back where all of their electricity was plugged into our house, pulling out the cords. <laughs> but it was wonderful to walk into that sense of family. Often we want to limit that to our bloodline, you know, our kin. But the human family is so much greater. And here was this wonderful family. The father of these three girls had passed away. And we were coming back and reflecting not only his on his life, but our life in this community. And there were neighbors I had grown up with that lived all around us in independence, some I had not seen for many years. And it wasn't just a warm glow of, gee, doesn't this feel, not, feel nice? No. It was knowing that I was part of that. Well, you know, I think that's what Jesus was conveying when He taught the Lord's Prayer to His disciples. When they asked Him, Lord, Master, Teach us how to pray. And so he revealed, as recorded 
in the Gospel of Matthew what it was to pray. And sometimes, very typical of us of the modern age, we get a set of instructions and we want to follow it to the letter, don't we? Well, it's got to be part A has to come right after part B and then you add screw C and if something's missing, it all falls apart. No, I think Jesus was saying, take this attitude. Because in his recorded words, it was, pray in this manner. And so he gave us a sequence. And the absolute beginning that we looked at last week, especially experiencing the language that Jesus used, the Aramaic, that wonderful opening, Abundwashmeya, acknowledging our Father. Some say the word Jesus used was more like our Papa or Daddy, an intimacy. So right away he was saying, to pray is to go within, to go within your closet, your privacy as he described it, to turn to inner realities. I'm struggling moving into my new place and finding enough closet space to put all the stuff in, so I don't think cramming things into what we call a closet was what Jesus meant. He meant to go to the inner realities of your life, our life as a church, our life as a human family, to get to the essence of it. That was the beginning of prayer. And then we acknowledged our Father. Now in the Aramaic language I pointed out last week, Jesus did not use a masculine word, you see. So if you choose, like we do in our unity tradition, to say, our father, mother, or our mother, that is your choice. It's what, what leads you into the sense that God is the creator the divine parent, the source of all of us. And then Jesus goes on to describe the qualities of this source of being. And then today, we look at the lines, give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts or transgressions if you prefer. In other words, you provide for us. Some describe the daily bread as the Aramaic words suggest, all that is necessary for your well-being. But also, this forgiveness of our debts is a freeing. Some would say the very essence of what we call healing, was setting us free, like our wonderful daily word this morning. So we have this great provision and this great freedom to consider. Next week we will continue with the prayer. But I wanted to take a little turn at this point where we dwelt in the Aramaic language last week, we will continue that in a class I will start in mid-May. For those of you that want to explore prayer, not just in this Aramaic language, but also in many traditions of prayer throughout the centuries, throughout many cultures, different ways to deepen our experience of prayer. But one way that that happened in our unity tradition was that Charles Fillmore, our co-founder along with Myrtle of what we call our unity work, Myrtle was very focused beginning in 1890, a year after 
publishing uh, began in April 1889 of modern thought, their first sharing of ideas for people who were interested in, as our scripture recounted, what is this all about? What am I a part of? How do I fit in? So Myrtle became interested in silent unity. Today we think of it as this worldwide service of blessing where two million people call each year or text or all the different ways that they can contact silent unity for support in their prayer needs. But when Myrtle initiated silent unity, it was a two-part deal. Any real relationship, doesn't it involve give and take? Well, for Myrtle, really for Charles as well, silent unity was not only someone to turn to in your need, but you as an individual said, I will agree to hold the affirmations of the month for silent unity in my daily prayer life. So I will participate in the work as well as ask for its blessing. It was a two-way street. Charles, being the writer, was very creative and he attempted to write what later was called the Great Invocation. Now, invocation is one of those fancy minister words. And all it means is to invoke, to call into your consciousness, your mindfulness, a truth or a reality. In a church service, that's what we start with when we have a call to worship. It means call the purpose, the intention of this gathering into our focus. So Charles wrote a prayer. You may be familiar with it. I use it occasionally. But today I wanted to look at it briefly because it seems to me it was Mr. Fillmore's way of hearing those words of Jesus pray in this manner. And then he attempted to create a prayer that took that manner of Jesus and re- worked it in a way that was appropriate to the modern soul. 2,000 years had passed in humanity's development since the time of Jesus. So let me just speak the prayer and then we'll look at just a couple of points today. It begins with that invoking or calling into my awareness my relationship with the Creator. How does this all come together? I am now in the presence of pure being and immersed in the Holy Spirit of life Love, wisdom. I acknowledge your presence and power, O blessed Spirit. In thy divine wisdom, now erase my mortal limitations. And from thy pure substance of love, bring into manifestation my world according to thy perfect law. Charles established that same sense of oneness with the God principle, our source of being. Then very clearly establishes in the prayer that this spirit is present and all-powerful. You see, that goes to what he described as his awakening, 
before the unity work began. And he had studied religions all around the world. Everything that he could get his hands on um, as a seeker in the 1880s. He said he tried everything. He had even taken workshops or correspondent courses, some of them costing as much as $50. In 1880s, my friends, $50 is like taking one of these special training courses that's maybe $5,000 or $8,000 for four days. That was an expensive endeavor. So he was really interested. But he said, all I hear is babble, talk, 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 about different ideas about the divine being. And Charles, being a very practical, business-minded person, said, now wait a minute. Let's get the relationship. If I am spirit, a living soul, and this God that they all keep talking about is spirit, then there's a relationship. And somehow, communication must be possible. So, in this formulation of this prayer, this invocation, it was no small thing to say, I acknowledge Your presence and Your power, O Blessed Spirit. He was establishing that relationship as Jesus did with the words, Our Father, the source of us all. Charles goes on to describe the same sort of provision and healing that Jesus indicated. Saying to this blessed spirit, Erase my mortal limitations. Those little views I hold of myself. Set me free from such a small picture. And in thy pure substance of love, and that idea unity had of what substance meant, it wasn't matter, it wasn't material stuff, it was the spiritual essence behind all creation. And that was God's love for His creation. A love that wasn't just a hug, a warm fuzzy, as our youth of unity like to say. It was a, the very stuff of life that we call forth that love of God to express outwardly as our world, our body, the capacities of our soul as God's creation, and the circumstances of our community, our relationship, our world that all that be harmonized with thy perfect law. Now, if law for you is too much about jail and prison and speeding tickets or whatever, then you may choose to use another word we like in unity, and that is principle. So you may say, in thy perfect principle the way things work, the truths of creation. Now, the reason I bring up Charles' great invocation of 1892 was not simply a history lesson, but to give you an example of how our founder in unity endeavored to seek in Jesus' words something so real that Charles had to reshape it or put it into his own 
words, but be careful. There's a lot to read between the lines. If you were with me in that prayer and thinking of the Lord's Prayer, you might have noticed, is there something missing here? Is there something missing? I am now in the presence of pure being and immersed in the Holy Spirit of life, love, and wisdom. I acknowledge Your presence and power, O blessed Spirit. In Thy divine wisdom, now erase my mortal limitations and from Thy pure substance of love, bring into manifestation my world according to to thy perfect law. Anybody hear anything listen, missing as compared to the Lord's Prayer? You may have heard there is no appeal of forgiving others. But we have to hear between the lines. If we don't understand this point, in unity metaphysics or unity teaching, it's not going to be as rich and powerful a teaching in our life, in our church, as perhaps it could be. When Charles would speak a prayer such as this and many affirmations, he would use I am as the true nature of of God's human being. The true nature of God's divine human being. What Charles liked to call with the great big phrase, the perfect idea of, ma of man in the mind of God. In other words, a masterpiece. So we have to be careful when we hear those affirmations, I am, that we're not putting a big me. It's all about me. When I know this truth of the divine individuality, of course I'm thinking of my life. But I know that it is a truth in Bill's life, in Sandy's life, in Irene's life. It is the Christ within. And we have to listen carefully. I was thinking just this morning, Dina always challenges me with the music. But you know, when we use very traditional words in the modern Christian Protestant sense, as we were singing this morning of celebrating the Son of Man, of celebrating the Christ, this too is speaking of that I am. So if the words for some of us may sound like the church I grew up in, most traditional, realize that to sing of the worship or celebration of the Son of Man or the worship of Jesus or of Christ, you have to understand that that is speaking of the divine truth within each one of us. Each one of us. And I'll close with a a little challenge. Just this new or just this week, we had an individual, I believe from Texas, a challenge. And she declared, and it got worldwide attention, that she simply does not support the idea of a woman being president. Oh my, she's the president of her own company, which made it a little bit of a challenge, but she said our commander-in-chief should always be a man. 
Now, some people didn't listen to how she went on to say, this is my opinion. I own it. Others may choose differently. So she was allowing others freedom. But the reason I bring it up is we constantly have a difficulty in speaking to each other as a species. Sky, you're a woman. Right. That is a part of her experience. But there is an individuality in her unlike any other. 